right. Well, they've turned me loose again, this time on a Sunday morning. So, all right, hang on to your seats. Get out while you can. If you, if you want to do that, Pastor Austin's down the hall. I think I got a good word for you this morning. I'm going to get right to it. The title of my message is, I've got plans. All right, to turn to those around you right now and just tell them, I got plans. All right, tell I got plans. Right now, as Pastor Zach is fond of saying, you turn to somebody who just ignored and say, sorry about that, I got plans and you aren't part of them. <laughs> yeah, don't say that, All right? Now, maybe sitting near somebody that you'd like to get to know, maybe you're single, somebody there, you might ask them if they have plans. Well, it's not the time and place to do that. Maybe after service, you can, you can do that. Well, I got plans, you got plans, we all have some kind of plans going on. The people in our passage today, in Genesis chapter 11, had plans. Go ahead and turn there. We're going to get there in just a second, continue our series in Genesis. Chapter 11, we're talking about the Tower of Babel. Now, a lot of stories from the Bible have kind of made their way into contemporary culture uh, in a variety of ways, movies, literature, sometimes just common vernacular that over time is so commonly used that people uh, almost forget where it came from. This is one of those passages. This is one of those accounts. For example, uh, there's a common language learning app, you may be familiar with it, called Babel. If somebody uh, rambles on and on incoherently, as I will desperately try not to do this morning, uh, they call that babbling. When a, when a baby begins to first vocalize saying we don't understand them yet, they are said to be babbling. So babble has become kind of synonymous with uh, confusing language or different dialects. In fact, many people see this account as, as pivotal in the historical development of a variety of earthly cultures but the main message of Babel is not ethnic or linguistic diversity. The lesson God wants us to learn here has to do with what motivates us to do what we do. And what happens when our plans are just that, our plans, by us and for us. Would you stand with me and let's pick up in Genesis chapter 11. I'm going to interject a little bit of commentary as I go on here. And then there's a couple of places I'm going to pause and you're going to help me fill that in. Will you do that for me this morning? Let's get into it in Genesis chapter 11, verse number 1. And it says, at one time, all the people of the world spoke the same language and used the same words. As people migrated to the east, they found a plain in the land of Babylonia and settled there. And they began saying to each other, let's make bricks and harden them with fire. In this region, bricks were used instead of stone, and tar was used for mortar. And they said, come, let us build a great city for, for who? For ourselves, with a tower that reaches into the sky. For this will make, who? Make us famous and keep from being scattered all over the world. We're going to talk not so much about what they were building, as why they were building. Verse number five, but the Lord came down to look at the city and the tower the people were building. You know, scripture personifies God a lot of times in this kind of way, but it's not as if God has to make a special trip to see what we're up to. He's well of our intentions, he's well aware of our thoughts before they even turn into actions. So verse number six, he says, look, the people are united and they all speak the same language. After this, nothing they do will be impossible for them. So come, let us go down and confuse the people with different languages. Then they won't be able to understand each other. Now I want you to keep in mind, this is not God enacting judgment on, on people who are go, going their own way. This is God showing mercy and saving people from their selves. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. Verse number 8 says, In that way the Lord scattered them all over the world, and they stopped building the city. And this is why the city was called Babel, because this is where the Lord confused the people with different languages. In this way, he scattered them all over the world. And people have remained scattered and separated and confused and at odds with God and each other ever since. You can be seated. If I were to put a uh, thesis or summary statement to this message this morning, here's what I want uh, to get across. Following our own plans leads to confusion and failure. But following God's plans leads to clarity and success. Our plans, confusion and failure. God's plans, clarity and success. You can go back a few chapters and we're reminded pretty starkly what happens when people go their own way. That's the most practical definition of sin, going our own way. 
And the Bible, one of the foundational teachings in the whole book is how doing things our own way always leads to separation and confusion. And so over and over, God warns us of the error of our own way, and he mercifully interrupts our plans time and time again, even when what we're doing feels right. In fact, Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12 says, there is a way that appears to be right to us, but in the end, it leads to death. Going our own way and making plans without regard for God is an issue that he takes very seriously. Now, we may not be uh, planning to build a tower to reach into the heavens and secure a legacy for, for us for all time, but we're all building something. We're all making plans. We're all trying to do something significant with our lives, something that will last. But what are you building and why? And what will it amount to when all is said and done? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I pray your anointing would be on me today as it's already upon that word, upon everyone who hears. Have your way this morning. Lord, arrest us in the middle of choices and decisions that may not quite be what you want for us. And God, show us your way, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So what's the plan? We all got plans. Some of us may not be that organized, may not be that motivated, may not be that purposeful. Some of us just uh, are the type who fly by the seat of our pants. Who am I talking to this morning who just kind of does that? Where's Pastor Weaver at? All right. (laughs) But we all got plans. We're up to something, you know, and what we do is important. The Bible says that one day we're all going to give account for the things we do with our time on earth. But more important than what we do is why we do it, because everything we do stems from a motive. Everything that comes out starts from within. Pastor Jeff talked about that last week. In fact, 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, the Lord doesn't see things the way we see them. People judge by outward appearances, but the Lord looks where? He looks at the heart. We can give people all kinds of impressions, good or bad, true or false, by the things we do or don't do, but God discerns our motives. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. The first thing I want to mention, we're going to look at four contrasts between our way and God's way. And the first one is simply this. Our motives, are they self-centered or are they God-centered? Verse number four says, come, let us build a great city for ourselves with a tower that reaches into the sky. This will make us famous and keep us from being scattered all over the world. Why were they building? Because they wanted to be famous. They want to ensure that they wouldn't be forgotten. Now, don't we all want to be known for something? Don't we want to do something significant with our lives? So what's wrong with that? Here's the problem. In today's uh, entertainment-driven culture, for many people, the highest aspiration is fame. To be known, to be, uh, to be admired, to be recognized. And many would sell their souls for a shot at stardom. Now, there's nothing wrong with making a mark. There's nothing wrong with wanting to leave a legacy. In fact, God wants us to make a difference in this world. But if the things that we are pursuing are primarily for our own good, for our own gain, or for our own glory, those things are going to come up disappointment. They're going to lead to discontentment and even disaster. And those who are building the tower here were doing it for themselves. They thought it would keep them from being scattered all over the world. But what they feared in the beginning ended up happening when it was all said and done because they were doing it their way. I want you to consider this about the two main reasons that it really gives for them building because most of the uh, divisive, the deceptive, destructive things that, that people do stem from two basic emotions, and that is fear and pride. Fear and pride. People fear what they don't understand, which leads to ignorance and prejudice. People fear uh, rejection, so they compromise their principles and do whatever it takes in order to find acceptance. Then there's FOMO, the the fear of missing out, which is often fueled by things like social media. As much as that's an appeal, studies show that it really leads a lot of people to depression and anxiety because they see everybody else's pictures and posts, and all of a sudden their lives look mundane in comparison. And fear breeds insecurity, which only accentuates that comparison game because, and that never ends well. Because when we compare ourselves with each other, we're either going to come to the conclusion that we're inferior And so we're going to try to overcompensate in some way? Or are we going to find that we're uh, superior, which just fuels into our pride, which was the main problem here at Babel. And whether it's drawing attention to ourselves or simply doing things our own way because we think we can handle it, that all stems from pride. 
And pride is the original sin of the devil himself. He says, I will ascend into the heavens. I will be like the most high. Satan is the ultimate example of doing things his way and for his own honor. And you know, he's really, really subtle at the way he presents those options and temptations in ways that we don't even recognize as evil. In fact, you might remember the time when Jesus and Peter were walking along the, the seashore and Jesus alluded to the fact that he was gonna have to suffer and die. And, and Peter just said, no way, that can't happen. And Jesus turned around and rebuked him and said, Satan, get behind me. You wanna talk about harsh. How do you think Peter felt at that? But Jesus said it was because Peter was thinking of things from a human perspective and not God's. But we do that all the time. Left to ourselves, we're always gonna follow our own inclinations. And it's harder than ever not to be self-centered in today's culture uh, because of a very subtle message that really bombards us through almost every medium out there. We hear it from the time uh, we're little kids, this uh, kind of a Disney brand theology or, or a Hallmark worldview. Sorry, Jeannie. But it says that we need to follow our hearts. We need to be true to ourselves. Do what's right for you. And man, that sounds good. Sounds so uplifting, so affirming. He even kind of sounds remotely spiritual. But the only problem is you won't find anything in God's word even remotely close to that. In fact, Jeremiah 17, 9 says that the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who even really knows how bad it is? Now that doesn't sound like something I ought to follow without question. Doesn't sound like something that's gonna bring me freedom and fulfillment in any way. In fact, the Bible says just the opposite. It says your own heart will deceive you. Your own intellect will fool you. Your own abilities will let you down and leave you empty. And in Genesis chapter 11, the people are following their own hearts. They're following their collective dreams, but they had no clue where those aspirations would take them because they were doing it for themselves. And their self-centered motives resulted in self-directed plans. Plans that were based on the fear of separation and the pride of reputation. And so they started building. And they made plans so they would be not become isolated or insignificant. But those plans failed, as will ours, if they're self-directed rather than God's. That's the second point. Motivation determines plans. Are your plans self-directed? Or are they God-directed? How many of you have had people in your life, maybe uh, your spouse, maybe uh, even a kid, who, who make plans, plans that involve you, but they don't always tell you ahead of time, so you always gotta check with somebody uh, to make sure before you put anything on the schedule. Any, anybody got, if the, if the person who does that kind of planning for you is right next to you, uh, and you don't appreciate that very much, just lean over right now and tell them that you don't like that very well all the time. Are you, this is a safe place. Right? They're not gonna get mad at you at church. Maybe on the ride home could be a different story. But, uh, but this morning we're talking about letting someone else direct your plans. But it's not the person beside you. It's somebody infinitely more reliable who knows exactly what every one of us needs. And here's the thing. Life inevitably involves making plans. Anything that we accomplish of any significance involves making plans and implementing plans. But if our plans are simply that, our plans... Our plans as individuals, our plans as, as couples, as families, uh, even our plans as a church or, or a community or as a country. If those plans are just our plans, if they originate from our wisdom and with our ingenuity, if they are by us and for us rather than from God and for God, then those plans will inevitably result in frustration, in futility, and failure. Even when those plans appear to be successful, they're going to fall far short of anything that God has for us. And the lesson to learn from this passage, I want you to get this, it doesn't just involve the big decisions. It doesn't just involve all the, the terrible, uh, prideful, sin, sinful, selfish things that we do because life comes down to the day-to-day -day decisions and even in the little things, are we looking to God? Are we listening for his guidance? Even when it's tough, even when it doesn't make sense, even when it's not necessarily what we would choose for ourselves. Because I think all of us here probably know that God knows what's best, but it's still easy to make our own plans, isn't it? But do we really understand the frailty of our own plans? We might be trying to do what's best for us and for our families, but unless we take time to hear from God, those plans are gonna be in an unstable foundation. Remember when the, the Twin Towers came down and 
and we watch them burn. Some of you, about you've just seen that on, 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 a, on a replay. But at one particular point in that structure, things failed under the heat of pressure. And when that did, everything above it came crashing down and everything below it was crushed. And this stack of blocks right here kind of represents the futility of our own plans. We can piece things together in our own wisdom, our own in ingenuity, and it may look kind of stable and reliable. But when we're making all these decisions for ourselves, all it takes is one decision, one choice that isn't, the, isn't good, is bad, maybe just not just the best thing. And the whole thing comes crashing down. That's the frailty of leaving our choices up to us. Psalm chapter 27 verse one says, unless the Lord builds the house, the work of the builders is wasted. I don't know about you, but I don't wanna waste my time on plans that are bound to fail. And that's exactly what'll happen if they're just your plans or my plans. No matter how good of an idea it may seem to be at the time. How many of you have ever done something that you've regretted? You even ask, can we, can, we, can we stop counting with that? All of us have done stuff we regret. How many of those things seem like a good idea at the time? Maybe you have a kid who got caught being guilty of something. They've even told you, it seemed like a good idea at the time. I'm sure Adam and Eve thought it seemed like a good idea at the time when they took the forbidden fruit and got the first taste of sin that's racked all humanity ever since. I'm sure lots, uh, to him, it seemed like a good idea at the time when given the choice to, to select the, the most uh, beautiful plot that he could find to settle on, but life in Sodom ended up compromising the entire family, and that became frightfully apparent when they were fleeing the city on the heels of annihilation. The book of Judges, before Israel had a king, says this in 17.6, it says, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And as a result, they drifted repeatedly from God and encountered one disaster after another. And I'm sure what they were doing seemed like a good idea at the time because they were following their heart. But Jesus never tells us to follow anything within ourselves. In fact, here's what he tells us in Luke chapter 9, verse 23. If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. Why? because of what he already told the prophet in Jeremiah 29, 11. Most of you know this verse. It says, for I, have, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, plans to give you a future and hope. And isn't that what every one of us wants? I mean, if we're gonna keep making plans, if we're gonna keep building, if we're gonna keep growing, don't we wanna make progress? Don't we wanna do things rather than just taking a step forward and two steps back? spinning our wheels and never really getting anywhere. But all of that hinges on our motives, and our motives determine our plans, and our plans determine the process. It determines how we go about things, and the question for point three is this. Are you gonna do it your way, or are you gonna do it God's way? One of the most consequential decisions or choices that people make in their own wisdom is how they're gonna view uh, or relate to God, or not. And that's probably what was going on in this passage. Let me give you just a little bit of background here. The central figure in most Mesopotamian cities was the temple complex where pe people worshiped whatever the patron deity was. And, and as part of that, it included a tower called a ziggurat. Right? Not a cigarette, a ziggurat. And, and it was kind of like an artificial mountain with a stairway that led uh, into the heavens, which was considered the gate of the gods. And its whole purpose was to make it convenient for the gods to come down and see what the people had accomplished and occasionally uh, bless the city. And to facilitate that, that stairway led to a small room at the very top of that tower that was typically furnished with a bed and a table that was regularly supplied with food so that the deity could kind of refresh himself uh, on the descent down to the city. And you notice how people's view of God impression, they put him in human terms and in, in human limitations. And throughout history, people have described and defined their gods uh, according to us, according to what we can understand and comprehend. But the God we serve defines us. We don't define him. And all that to say, we're not necessarily talking about people like a lot of times we th that maybe we think of when we see this passage, who are just going on their own way and totally disregarding God. God was probably in the picture for them, or some kind of God. And for us, God is in the picture. He's part of our lives. But like the people at Babel, are we trying to make it convenient for God to fit into our routines, into our plans, 
to see what we're up to rather than living like he's always there and wants us to get in sync with what he's doing. Because doing things our own way and on our own terms is, is never the way to get God's attention. In fact, that's religion and that never ends well. The Bible tells us that, that the way to get God's attention is this. Look, listen to what it says in Isaiah chapter 57. It says, for this is what the high and exalted one says. He who, is, who lives forever, whose name is holy. I live in a high and holy place. He's given us that picture. But he says, I don't just live in a high and holy place, but also with the one who is contrite and lowly in spirit. To revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. That's the kind of person who gets God's attention. Because there's no doubt that people can achieve uh, great things. God's creative mark on every one of us uh, ensures that potential. But our God-given abilities are meant to honor him. And when people take what's reserved for God and they do it to elevate themselves, uh, then th that's not gonna end well. Their accomplishments are gonna come to nothing. Only when we surrender those things to God and reserve them for his honor are they gonna lead to fulfillment and success. But that wasn't the case here. Because in verse number six it says, look, the people are united and they speak the same language. After this, nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. So come, let us go down and confuse the people with different languages, and then they won't be able to understand each other. And in that way, the Lord scattered them all over the world, and they stopped building the city. To be honest, I kind of wondered if there was going to be anything to this point because God interrupted the process. They didn't hardly get uh, any point to it because God confounded their ability to communicate, but he didn't do that out of some uh, sense of insecurity. He didn't do that to keep them from fulfilling their greatest potential as if somehow they were a threat to his sovereignty. He did it to save them from themselves. He did it to spare them from the consequences of their own way, to keep them from wasting their time on, on a futile endeavor. You know, one of the greatest tragedies of life is when a person finds what appears to be success apart from God. Because somebody who achieves that illusion of success is not likely to ever turn and recognize their need for him. But on the other hand, one of the greatest displays of God's mercy is when he let us come to the end of ourselves. When we realize we have nowhere to go and our way just isn't gonna cut it and so we turn to him and we start relying on him. Ironically, those are the times in life when we get the most frustrated. Those are the times we get the most angry, e even at God, as if when our plans fall apart, it's the end of the world, when in reality, God may be sparing us from something worse. Now, God's gonna let people go their own way a lot of times, right? He lets us get what we think that we want, and he'll use that as a means of correction to show us that our own way isn't gonna cut it, and that we look to him for the help that we need. You see, when our plans fall apart and come to a halt, it may be God's way of interrupting things and redirecting our plans, our imperfect plans, and showing us his perfect way. Sometimes no is God's mercy in disguise. Sometimes no is God's mercy in disguise. Now, it doesn't mean that following God's plan is gonna be smooth sailing. We're in a world that's defying God and going its way, and we're gonna face opposition. We're gonna, we're gonna face resistance but God is always behind the scenes working for our good. Sometimes when God interrupts, it's just a matter of timing. Not that you haven't heard from God or that your heart's in the wrong place. Like Abraham, Abraham was a godly man. Look what happened when he got ahead of God, like sometimes we do. When, when he wondered, how in the world is God ever gonna fulfill this promise he gave me to, to make a, a great nation out of my descendants? He's 100 years old, and so he took the advice of his wife and got together with her maid and had a baby that way in the world and nations have been suffering consequences ever since. So if you think you've heard something from God, just be patient. Man, I can tell, I don't have time to tell, I can tell you three or four, uh, maybe five main uh, uh, transitions in my life where I was certain I heard what God was gonna do and it didn't happen. And I was hurt, I was, I was confused, I was angry at some of those times. But I didn't give up, and in every one of those instances, God brought it to, to pass in the end in a better way than I ever would have on my own. Psalm chapter 16, verse nine says, we can make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. In other words, God determines where our plans are gonna take us, whether that's a good place or a bad place. But one thing is for sure, our own plans are never gonna take us to the places that God's would if we submit our ways to him. Proverbs 19, 21 says, you can make many plans, but the Lord's purposes 
will prevail. The Lord's purposes will prevail. So, man, get on the winning side. It all comes down to who's guiding the process. If we're doing it, even with our best efforts and intentions, our plans are gonna fall far short in the end. And if we keep persisting in our own way, we're gonna eventually self-destruct. But if God directs what we do, the end result will not only honor him, it will bring us true success. Motivation determines plans, plans determine process, and process determines the results. Are the results we experience gonna be God-honoring or self-destructing? Because that's the difference between success and failure. Now I realize that for followers of Jesus, and hopefully most of you here, the issue is not blatant rebellion against God or disregard for what he wants you to do. A lot of times it just comes down to the fact that we haven't been consulting him or putting him in charge of the choices we make. It all comes down to trust. Do we really believe that he has our best intentions to the point where we're gonna submit our ways to him and do things his way instead of our own? Proverbs chapter five, or chapter three, verses five and six. You probably all know this, right? Look at it with me. It says, trust in the Lord with most of your heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not depend on your own. Oh, I think I got this. I think I know what I need to do. I got got it figured out. No, not that way. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in almost everything that you do. Seek his will when all else fails. Seek his will when the hard things that you can't figure out. No, it says seek his will in all you do and when you do that, he will show you which path to take. One translation says that he will make your path straight. How many of you have taken the long way around in some of the decisions you made? You thought that maybe you were taking the scenic route and it just got you lost and disoriented. When this proverb tells us to trust in the Lord and seek him in all you do, or as one translation that's more familiar tells us to acknowledge him in all of your ways. When it says to acknowledge, doesn't just mean to recognize his presence. Oh, hey God, you're here. It means to acknowledge his authority, acknowledge his leadership, acknowledge what his word says, and then deliberately choose to follow that plan in all of you do. Now, that doesn't mean you have to be strapped by every decision. Doesn't mean you're struck in the drive through saying, oh, do I uh, get the Big Mac or the quarter with cheese? I can't decide. No. But God's saying, hey, I want you to, to look to me, to consult me in prayer. I want you to always look to my word for guidance about big things, little things, about everything. That doesn't mean we're, we're gonna be on hold until, until we hear from heaven. Because if you're in tune with God, if you've got an open ear to the Holy Spirit and you're ready to follow him, then you can trust that the choices you make are things that God wants you to do, that they're guided by him. The problem at Babel was they were doing it for themselves and maybe just hoping that the gods approved. Don't follow their example. Instead, follow the example of God's son who showed us how to pray when he said, Father, I want your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And when he prayed in the garden the night before he gave his life for us and said, not my will, but yours, be done. You see, when it comes to following God and his plan, surrender always leads to success. Surrender always leads to success. This morning, you may not be rebelling against God's plans, but are you resisting in any way? And if not, maybe you're just not recognizing what exactly it is, and this morning you just need clarity instead of confusion. Perhaps you do recognize God's plan, but you just haven't quite surrendered to him yet. Or maybe you're just unsettled about the timing. We're gonna get an opportunity to express trust in God for those things today. So whatever became of the Tower of Babel, did they ever use it? How, how far did they get on it? The Bible doesn't really say. In fact, nowhere does it tell us what happened. And that's just the point. Because all the best laid plans, all the greatest uh, attempts to leave a legacy are gonna come to nothing if we're doing it our way. Unless the Lord builds the house, the work of the builders is wasted. I don't know about you, but I don't want my life's work to be wasted. Now, I'm not saying if you're doing things your own way that 
you're not in tune at all with God or that somehow you're going to miss it, you're not going to make heaven, I'm not saying that. Because even if your life is founded on God, listen to what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. It says, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is already laid. All right, it's talking about people who know Jesus. For anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials. They may use gold, silver, precious jewels, or wood, hay, and straw. But on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. And the fire is going to show if that person's work has any value. Now, I'm not going to light that on fire. <laughs> I intended to. I tried it. Man, that's a, it's a grand fire. And the smoke and everything, all right? It would have been a spectacle. Probably would have been a distraction. I know it would have been to Pastor Weaver. <laughs> but I'm not going to do that because this morning, I don't want anything to distract us because I, I believe God is telling me that he wants to be the distraction. He wants to be the interruption to some of our plans, and he was for me last night. Austin texted me last night, said he was praying, praying this morning for me that God would give me rest. I woke up and thought that it must have been about 5, 5.30. It wasn't even 2 o'clock. And man, my head was congested like you wouldn't believe, and I said, this, this can't be. I'm not going to be able to sleep all night, and I laid there. And I got like some of the things I said there. I got really frustrated. I started to get kind of angry. And then all of a sudden, God said, what are you preaching about? And I believe God interrupted me and said, I'm going to take you a little different, different direction at the end here. We can accumulate a lot, of, a lot of things in life, but to be honest, even in God's people, a lot of stuff we put our time into is what the Bible describes as wood, hay, and stubble. And it's going to be burned up in an instant. But you know what's going to be left there? Those few little things that maybe we thought, man, does this really amount to anything? Things we're doing for God, lives we touched. That's still going to be there when it's all burned up. But I believe God is saying to us today that he wants to take us a whole different route. And you know what? It wasn't that he was taking me a whole different direction. It was just a matter of saying, instead of going this way, I want you to go this way. I think sometimes we're afraid of what God's going to do because it's totally going to turn everything upside down when he's just saying, no, I'd rather divert you here because this is the better way. I've got something for you that I don't want you to miss. You know what all this represents? All of these things are choices. They're just decisions. That, that's what life is. Not the stuff, because all that comes from a choice, a motive. And this morning, there are some things that we're doing, some choices that we're making or maybe about to make that God says, no, I've got a different direction for you. I want you to just bow your head for a second. I don't know what your issue may be this morning. Because again, I don't want you to get the idea you're just talking about the, the big stuff, the building the, to the tower to reach the heavens. No, because that isn't how life happens. Life happens day by day, choice by choice, and the little things. And God says, I'm gonna discern your motives. I wanna direct your plans. I wanna guide the process. And maybe you're making a decision about something in your life that it seems like you're, you're kind of doing it on your own, but may maybe you're, you're just not sure that it's God because you may not have really consulted him on it. Maybe it involves a decision you make, maybe a purchase or, or something with your finances. Maybe it involves a, a relationship. Maybe something you're planning for the future, your family. Maybe just something that you, you do in your, in your spare time. Maybe something to do with your involvement at, at church or your giving to mission. It could be any number of things. Maybe you're a young person and you're looking for direction about your college education. Maybe you're an older person and, and you've done, done your time, you've made your life decisions, you've, you've worked, you've raised family, you're retired, and maybe you just don't see yourself as having to make a, a lot of big decisions at this point. But don't sell God short. He may want to do something greater with you at this time of life than you, than you ever imagined. You need to open your mind to that. But this morning, you're in the midst of making some decisions, and you realize that, you know, maybe you haven't really rebelled against God, but but maybe you're just not recognizing what he's doing. And this morning, you say, God, I, I want to hear from you. I want to I do things your way. If you're here this morning, and, 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 and that's you, and in any way you're saying, I, I'm making a decision, and I may just be doing it on my own. I'm not sure.
But I want to make sure I'm following God's way and not man. With the other heads bowed, I just want you to look up and, and catch my eye for a second and say, that's, that's me. I'm making that kind of decision right. I got things going on in my life right now that I just know I need God's guidance for. Not big things, just decisions. Yeah, yeah, a number of you. Here's what I want to do this morning, all right? I don't want to put you on the spot. A lot of times we got kind of intimidated by, by these altars, but you know what? The altars were quite a spectacle too. Fire and smoke and all that stuff. And at one point, God said, you know what, I've had enough of that. The smoke is getting to me. I don't want it. I don't want your sacrifices. What I want uh, is your life. That's what, I, that's what I want. And I want it on a daily, decision by decision based. I want your choices to be founded on me. And this morning, you know that that may not be the case. I want everybody in this place to stand. Worship team, you can go ahead and come. And those of you who, who looked up and acknowledged that, I'm, I'm going to ask you to help everybody out this morning because there's, there's more people that, that need to be here. And just simply, I'm not going to call people down to pray for you. You're not going to come. You're not going to have to put anything on the spot. But these few minutes as we close, I want to step down to this altar because this represents a place where we lay things down and surrender. Throughout Scripture, it was a symbolic place. It kind of still is. But the lies that we say, God, uh, this is yours, that's very real. And I believe this morning he's just calling you to say, I want you to step out and acknowledge that you're surrendering this to me. Whatever's going on in your life, I didn't speak. Holy Spirit, speak right now. And tell us what we're in the midst of choosing or deciding right now. I need your guidance. I want your will to be done, not mine. And so as the worship team just begins to sing a song that talks about my surrender, I want us to do uh, more than that. I want you to just step out for these few minutes as we close and sing a song. I want you to open your life to God and say, God, I'm here to surrender to you. If that was you, if you looked or if you didn't, I just want you to come. Begin to join me here at this altar. And let's, and let's worship God from here for just a couple minutes before we go. And in so doing, we're acknowledging, God, I, I need you. I want you to direct my choices. I need something from you. Uh, maybe confusion in your life. Maybe you're angry, you're upset right now uh, because something hasn't gone your way. It's fallen apart. And you need to realize that maybe God's mercy in redirecting you just to the place that he wants you. So begin to sing this morning. I don't have to belabor it any longer. If, if that's you and you just say, God, I need you in my choices this morning. I want to make sure that you, I want you to come and join us here at these altars. And let's let God direct us in the way he wants to today.